Gotta get in the studio. Gotta get in the studio. A lot of people ask, what's the difference? A lot of people ask, what's the difference between a producer? That's a hard thing to say. A lot of people ask, what's the difference? I've had strep throat, I don't know. A lot of people ask, what's the difference between a producer and an engineer? Let's find out. Hey everybody, welcome to the channel. Uh, I'm James and I'm back. I, I had to take a, a week off there. We had uh, a little bit of uh, strep throat. So my voice is still a little weird, but we are back. Anyway, thank you so much. Like and subscribe, comment, whatever. Anyway, here we go. Ask James. Uh, people have been asking to do something about what's the difference, what's the difference between a producer and an engineer. So I think... So I can only speak for myself and my own experience and what I've seen. Um, I've got my little board here. For me, I mostly produce. Um, I very re rarely just uh, engineer somebody's record or just run Pro Tools. Um, I do periodically. I actually do it more so here in Nashville than I ever did in L.A. Um, Mostly because I just have my own clients and I kind of am a bit of a one man show. Um, and I sometimes I'll have somebody engineer for me um, if I'm like tracking, but usually, like if I'm tracking guitar, I like to just track and engineer. I don't really like that person between me, between me and Pro Tools, because it actually sometimes is more frustrating and it feels slow and like they never know like the right place to punch me in or so I don't know it's I just like doing it myself so yeah so I, I a lot of times I just produce and and do everything myself but here in in Nashville there is a, a fair amount of work for just being an engineer and I get calls to just like people just want to come in and they have a producer and they want to track vocals or they want me to play guitar but they want me to, to just engineer or whatever you know there's different things so a thing that I have noticed that's different um, and it's it's pretty big time different. Um, the producer feels more like the boss. Engineering to me feels more like an employee a lot of times. Now out here, so this is this has just been my my uh, experience with working in the quote unquote Nashville machine of uh, making records the way they a lot of times they record here. Um, I get called, I work for a couple of labels, and I just engineer. So they'll have five guys come in. Um, they'll, you know, they'll, they, it's always drums, bass, guitar, piano, and sometimes like acoustic guitar. So they'll have like five guys, and then they track live, and they do it in three-hour blocks, and it's, it's quite expensive. So they want to try to get like a lot of times four songs finished in three hours and nobody knows the music and they're just all reading numbers the, the Nashville number chart and um uh so so being an engineer when I engineer for that I'm not the point guy I'm not in charge I'm just running pro tools um getting sounds getting levels and a lot of times I will tell I'll ask the producer before we start I'll be like hey do you want me to just like like as we say in the in the business, do you want me to just hit space bar in three? Meaning, do you just want me to like record, turn, playback, do this, drop markers, like just do that? Or do you want me to say anything? And I always ask them right up front because a lot of producers will be like, oh, no, dude, man, you know, you're skilled. You're you if you, you hear something you don't like or you think this say it. Um, but I would never as an engineer take it upon myself to just say something. Um, because it's not, it's not usually the engineer's place. Um, and I could go into a lot of detail about that actually, but I won't. It's just not usually the engineer's place. But what I'll do is I'll ask them because a lot of them know me. They know that, you know, I, I own a studio and that I produce records and I mix. So a lot of times they're like, yeah, man, if you hear something. And then sometimes they're like, yeah, just kind of run it by me, which means if I hear something, I'll usually turn to them and be like, oh, is that bass out of tune or is that 
groove right or do you think this tempo is too slow? And I also say it to the producer so that then he gets to go say, hey guys, I think maybe the song's too slow. And there's something magical about that. So imagine you're a, a client or your band and you're paying this producer some fee to make your record. And then there's this, this, this dude just engineering and then he's the one saying, hey, uh, I think that's out of time, or is that guitar in tune, or maybe that's too busy, or maybe, then they'd be thinking, well, what do, why do we have a producer, man? This engineer seems to know more or something. So you can put your, you can, you can, by saying sometimes too much, you can make the producer look bad. So a lot of times I will even, even if the producer says, yeah, just say something, a lot of times if the band's playing, and I hear something, I'll just turn to the producer and I'll be like, hey man, and be sometimes really, because a lot of times the clients in the room, the band's in the, in the live room and in, the, and in the, the, the ISO booths, and it's just like me, the producer, and a lot of times the artist. And a lot of times the artist is like sitting off to the side on his phone. He's not necessarily integrated into the system. And I'll be, produ I'll be engineering and I'll turn around and I'll be like, is, and, I, and, I, and for me, I never usually just say, this is what I think. I, I usually kind of like, I finesse it in. I'll be like, is that guitar sound in tune? Then he'll be like, play it back. And then he'll go on the talk back and be like, hey, uh, you know, Joe on guitar, he's like, listen, I think that guitar might be a little out of tune. And then you enable him to still be the boss and not, you know, overstep your boundaries. So that was a big thing with my father. My father instilled that in me. My father owned a car dealership and that was the thing, like when you, were a salesman and you were selling cars, people didn't talk to your clients, you know, because it just, I don't know, it just wasn't, it, this was never a good thing. So I was instilled, that was instilled in me at a young age. And the flip side is if I am producing and then there's an engineer, which occasionally happens if I go to a, a big studio to track a band live, and usually the engineers are cool, but every now and then you get these like Weisenheimer hip slick and coolers that just got out of school, and they're saying a bunch of stuff in front of the client and you have to take them to the side and you're like, hey, listen, buddy, I'm the boss. So if you've got any bright ideas, either keep them to yourself or run them past me, but don't go to the client. And then usually they're like, oh, okay, I didn't know. And then you're like, yeah, well, I just, you know, now you know. Because sometimes you, you can get a, you, as an engineer, you can get yourself into hot water by doing that. Um, especially if you've got like a really headstrong, arrogant, uncool producer, which there's a number of those people <laughs> walking planet Earth. I'm not one of them. I'm usually pretty chill, um, though I can get my feathers ruffled if, if somebody steps, uh, steps over the line with all that stuff. So you just got to kind of know your place. But sometimes they really want me to just drive. You know, the producer's like, well, geez, you're better at this. You, you know, you're kind of more skilled at, at making sure bands are, you know, in time and all this stuff. And then they just let me drive and then I, I, I go. But here, here's my experience with Nashville. And I, 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 this is totally just my experience, but it's how I feel. And I've seen it countless times. A thing that I've noticed is that in Nashville, when you're doing the kind of quote unquote music row, bang them out, four songs, everybody's reading, the quality control for the most part is questionable. And I know a lot of people are going to think I'm crazy because everybody thinks that the only thing there is to making records is to have hot players that can read. I don't believe that. I don't, you know, I don't think that slapping a chart in front of, you know, some guitar player that's awesome is necessary, does ne necessarily constitutes a great record. I just don't. Um, I mean, you know, there'll be some nifty guitar playing on it, but that doesn't make it a good record. The thing that I have noticed because of the, the ecosystem here in, in Nashville and the speed that you have to work at is that creativity is like kind of like almost at the bottom rung 
of the hierarchy of making music in Nashville. And a lot of people say, oh, it's the Nashville cookie cutter thing or whatever. You know, I don't know. But the reason I say this is because when I'm in a session with a producer at a big studio and I'm just the engineer and now they have four mu- or five musicians playing, right? So if four of them are scale and one of them is double scale because he's the session leader, that's the guy that writes the charts and kind of usually kind of pseudo hires the band. So now you've got, you know, a, a drummer at 110 bucks an hour or whatever, a keyboardist at 110 bucks an hour, a bass player at 110 bucks an hour, uh, a, a acoustic guitar player at 110 bucks an hour. Then you've got a guitar player who's the session leader. He's now like probably 220 an hour. And if it's somebody known like Brent Mason or whatever, it could be 330 or up. It could be triple scale if they're a name. And they're in charge of kind of running the band and writing the charts. And a lot of times they write the charts literally on the fly. They come in, the guy plays the work tape, and they're all listening, and the guitar player's doing this, and as soon as he's done with it, he goes through it, makes sure it's good. He hands it to me. I run to the printer. I print them off. Everybody gets them. So it it can be a little bit of a slow process in the beginning of getting the the charts ready because they're not always ready. Um, And then a lot of times they will kind of have the charts but then when they get there, the singer's like, oh, listen, I shortened the bridge and we switched the key. You know, they, they've made changes, so they have to doll up these charts. So a lot of times if you've got a session from, let's say, 10 to 1, three hours, it's pretty much almost 11 before you start recording because you're going through some charts, getting everybody's sounds, people are showing up, the guitar player's late, whatever the drama is. So by the time we get, we're getting ready to record uh, already as an engineer, I'm being rushed. Everybody, you, know, you feel the rush, the rush, the rush, because we've got two hours and 10 minutes. We want to get four songs done because now for three hours, it's costing this dude that's producing you know, or the, the song or the, the artist. It's costing him four thousand dollars or whatever, because he's got four musicians at, let's say, a hundred bucks an hour. So just to keep it simple. So that's four hundred dollars an hour for them. That's twelve hundred bucks for the band, right? Now and then it's an additional, I guess, uh, two hundred, an additional like six hundred just for the session leader, who's usually the guitar player, the piano player. That's the guy that writes the charts. So then you put that on top of it. Then he's paying the producer whatever he's paying. He's paying the studio rate, which is whatever for three hours. Or if he books out, if they do sets of three hours, he books the whole day. It's a thousand dollars, eight hundred, twelve hundred, whatever it is. And then they're paying me. So this it, it can be like three, four thousand dollars for this like three hour block. So, you know, it's like they say in in Spinal Tap, mime is money. So they're pushing. They're pushing me. So as an engineer. A thing that I've had to learn working here in Nashville is to just let a lot of stuff slide that I wouldn't let slide. Um, coming from Los Angeles, which which the, the ecosystem that I worked in was totally different. It was all about taking your time, creating a unique sound. You didn't want to sound like everybody else. Like you wanted to try to find, I mean, you spent a half a day just getting guitar sounds because you wanted your record to try to be unique. Where here, it's like everybody comes in with the same thing. The, the, the guitar player's got the telly with the pedal board with the same six pedals that everybody's got and, and a deluxe reverb. Like, that's it. And if you want crunch, heavy guitars, he, he has a Boss Super Overdrive. Like, that's it. It's not like switching amps, switching out guitars. Let's tune, do this, try that. Boo a capo here. Let's put that. Let's get the Echo Plex out. No, let's take the Echo Plex. You know, there's none of that. It's just like record. Um, the other thing is there's a lot, a lot I find a, the periodically there's 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 uh, groove issues and even with great players you know i mean i've recorded the dudes that played in you know vince gill's band and all these big artists and there's groove issues because they're human beings and they're reading and sometimes it just starts to feel like they're reading and then it sucks but as an engineer you just gotta let it roll it's it's a very touchy thing because you can't like this this songwriter or this uh, singer has like 3600 bucks. That's it. And he's got to get four songs finished because then he's got to go and do vocals later. And that's a whole other thing and mix it and edit it. But 
So the thing I have noticed here, like you're in the room, as an engineer, you're in the room now listening to playback of what the band just recorded. The band is standing there, right? It's a who's who of like the Nashville hot cats. I'm playing it and there's mistakes everywhere and nobody says anything. And I'm thinking to myself, well, if, you know, these guys are supposed to be like really hot. They have to have hear, they have to hear this. So I don't think they're ignorant to it. I just think that it's just op standard operating procedure, as they say in the military. You know, it's like, well, you know, if it's like, <laughs> it's like if my bass didn't explode and I didn't land on the wrong note, we're good. If it's a little out of pocket and it feels weird or it's fret noise or I bend it a little sharp, we're going to let that roll. We're going to just let that go. So that's been one of my experiences with, doing Nashville. Now Nashville's going through a bit of a renaissance right now with the influx of like a zillion people from LA, which to a lot of old school Nashville people, it's the it's become the bane of their existence. But for me, I like it because I don't really, I'm not, there's nothing really exciting to me sometimes about the way they make music in Nashville. It just, it, it's not, it's not my thing. So to bring in a little LA and take your time and you know, it's pretty nice. So, but it's still, it'll always be Nashville, I guess. I don't know. Whatever. It's just my experience. Who knows? I'm just some guy. Pressing space bar in three. All right, produce. Yeah, also producers usually, a difference is producers uh, will usually get paid by the project or for the record of the song. Engineers usually more of an hourly thing. So, kind of depends on your temperament. I think, too, engineering is a lot for more, maybe more, a lot of more younger guys and maybe a lot of a lot of more older guys that are like kind of cycling out of the biz because I think that when you first get in you just get out of Belmont or Blackbird you don't know anybody you're just engineering but as you start to get clients then you realize well I can engineer for whatever 18 bucks an hour 20 bucks an hour or whatever 25 bucks an hour or I now I've got clients that are paying me like you know $8,000 to do three songs so you're, there's more bread sometimes in production, but sometimes it's not, you know, I mean, it's, it is what it is. So, but you got to kind of have clients usually to be a producer or be attached to a record label. So a lot of times engineering is where you start. And then some people maybe just stay in engineering or they move on to be a producer. It also depends on your temperament. I mean, I think you inherently have to be a more musical person to be a producer, a thing I've noticed about guys in the music business that are just engineers, they're not usually the most musical people. They, they don't really play. And when they play, they're not, you know, they're not really good. It's not, you know, they, they were always like the sound man or something. You know what I mean? They were never the dude. So <clears throat> they, they may be a little shy in that area. And that's not to say all of them, just you see it. I, I see it anyway. Where producers a lot of times will sit down at a piano and you're like, geez, this guy's like a virtuoso. You know what I mean? Like it, it's, they're, 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 they can be, they have a tendency to maybe be a little bit more musical where engineers are a little more kind of ones and zeros, meaning they're more into like sound and sonics and computer programs and, and all that stuff. Oh... What does that say? Nashville, more engineering. Engineering, keep mouth shut. I already said that. All right, so we're going to end this with a little funny quip. And keep this in mind, guys, whether you're engineering or producing, mostly producing, which is if the record is great, it's because of the artist. And, the, and if the record stinks, it's because of the producer. Right? So, you know, you get done with this three song, 10 song, six month, two month ordeal <clears throat> with a person, you hand them their record or you download, they download their files and they play it for their friends. And if their friends go, oh my God, this is unbelievable. You're the next Adele. And they're like, I know, aren't I so amazing? But then if they listen to it and they're like, I don't know, man. It doesn't sound too hot. Who produced this? Oh, you know, that guy Joe Schmo over there on 16th Street. Yeah, he really effed this thing up. 
And the beautiful part is, as a producer, you're never there to defend yourself. You're never there to say, oh, so you don't think the record's good. Let's talk about how this dude can't sing. We'll start there. Oh, and then we'll go to like the songwriting. Or let's talk about how he was too cheap to get a real drummer and we ended up having his neighbor play drums. So it ended up taking me 10 hours to beat detect these three songs, right? You know, you're never there to defend yourself. And it's not to say that records don't get messed up because of the producer. And it's not to say that I haven't fallen short as a producer because I have. But just keep in mind, that is a very prevalent thing, man. When that record is awesome, it's because the artist is a genius. And if the record is not so awesome, it's because somebody behind a computer lacked. And you're not there to defend yourself. And also keep in mind, if people are going to cut down a person's record, they're not going to be prone to critique them personally in front of them. They're not going to say, well, I don't really like this because I don't like your voice. They just wouldn't do it. They would all, always talk about the sound or something because they don't want to hurt the person's feelings, right? But they do want to kind of convey that they think the person needs to keep moving forward and get better or this, you know, whatever. You know what I'm saying? So the only person left to blame is the producer. So just be careful of that and keep that in mind. And I think for me, what I've learned, what I've extrapolated from that reality is uh, to just do my best always to do my best. You know what I mean? Just, just do my best and then that's all I can do. And if the record comes out amazing, great. If it doesn't come out that amazing and, you know, it was because it wasn't that great of music, I, there's nothing I can do about it. If, if it doesn't come out that amazing and it was my fault, I did something, I fell short somewhere or I dropped the ball or I didn't have the skill set, <clears throat> a lot of times I'll try to remedy it or find somebody like like get somebody in that's better at this than me or or sometimes it just be you just chalk it up sometimes as a learning experience unfortunately um so that's it and i'm i'm your buddy i'm james lugo and uh like i said i kind of was on a, a path with all these videos but i had to take a week or two off and i was had strep throat and i had a i had to sing i had a, I had a show and and also, I'm learning Final Cut Pro. Um, I've, um, th today, I'm going to finish the first course of it. Final Cut Pro is the, op is the program that I use to edit these videos. So I'm learning it through lynda.com. So it's like, a, you know, it's like a formal class like online, but not formal class, but you know, it's structured video series of learning. And I, I download the, uh, the movie that we're editing from and so uh, it's really going to be exciting. The next few months, I'm going to be really getting into Final Cut, getting better at camera, getting better at producing these videos. I'm learning how to make thumbnails and getting better at the sound of the videos. Um, this is the new updated Final Cut that just came out this past week, 10.4. Uh, the new audio plugins are much better. So the sound should sound better in this video than the video from two weeks ago. Um, and the color correction is improved and there's 3D, 360 stuff, which that's not going to obviously happen in this video, but uh, sorry about that, man. Strep throat is intense, but you know, what's amazing. I, I, I could feel my body fighting it off. It's like, I have an immune system again. Uh, it's just, uh, I've gotten, you know, getting healthy over the last couple of years and working out and losing weight has really paid off. So anyway, um, like and subscribe, comment if you have ideas. The next couple of weeks, the videos are going to be coming out uh, weekly, but it's going to be a little funky because I've got family in, we've got Christmas, we've got New Year's, I'm going to LA, I'm going to Vegas. So the next few weeks are going to be a little funky, but mid-January, it's all going to kick into high gear. So uh, yeah, man, stay with us. Peace out. Make it if we
Hold it, hold it, hold it. Hello, why are we stopping? Uh, just, just a couple of things. Um, when you sing, use your diaphragm. I didn't bring it. 